Lord Jesus, we need you and you, we want you here with us this morning. Please uh, bless the sharing of what you are doing and uh, by the power of your word, encourage your people. God, raise up a faithful generation who are not swayed by the ways of the world and the ways of the enemy, who have the faith to believe that, uh, that you are doing an amazing amount in the world. And Lord, that you would show us how we can be a part of what you are doing so that we might have a testimony that you are great and you are good. And so we just ask that you would bless this time this morning and bless your people this morning. Amen. Amen. So I am, uh, I, I want to uh, just start uh, by, by throwing out this, this, this little truism, call it Reverend Palmer theology. Um, this is not found anywhere in the Bible. It's just something that I find to be true. Uh, it jives with the word of God, also with my experience of uh, the way that the Lord works. Of course, God is the, uh, he's the creator. He is the sustainer. He can do anything that he wants just by thinking it into being. Um, it is, that is the way uh, that he created the universe, simply by speaking it, and it was so. And, and yet, this, this God, the, this creator of the universe, I, I believe that God prefers to use human hands. When the Lord is doing a work, of course he can do it without our help. He can do it without our prayers, and sometimes he does. Uh, God can do things supernaturally, and oftentimes he does. But I believe that God prefers to use human hands in what he is doing. Um, and you can see all throughout the scripture that when the Lord says, hey, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, he usually brings it about through human means. When he says to the nation Israel, I'm through, I'm done, you've, you've turned away from me for the last time, your corruption is so deep now, there's no way for me to redeem it, even your priests are corrupt, your whole religious system, you're bringing all these tithes and these offerings for me, but they have nothing to do with me, I am going to destroy you, and he did that by bringing in a foreign, he used human beings to make that happen. I think God often prefers to use human hands. How many people have we prayed for that God would cure their sickness, something going on, and God used a doctor somewhere to say, hey, I know what's happening here. Let's do a little of this, a little of that, and bang, it was so. Uh, how many times is someone in need, in dire need, and God could create manna on the ground in front of them, but for some reason he prefers a human being to wander along and notice this person in need and say, hey, what do you need? Well, I need some food. Well, I got some food. Here you go. And this means that Christians are constantly in danger of not seeing the Lord using, doing, making, processing, bringing things about because humans are involved all over the place. And so it might seem like, well, God didn't do that. God didn't do that. The doctor did that. Well, God didn't do that. You know, the, the, that NGO did it. Well, God didn't do that. Somebody actually just went there and did the thing. But I'm telling you, no. God prefers to use human hands. And uh, if you get nothing else out of this morning, I would like for you to get that God is doing an incredible work. God is in the middle of, of being this incredibly generous, wonderful, amazing Lord. He is moving mightily, and it's happening right now. It's happening all over the world. It's happening here and there. And just like one other truism that I have found, is it's almost never center stage where the spotlight is shining. It's almost always just off to the left, off to the right, hidden in the shadows here, this little place there where things are out of the way. Nobody knows about it. There's no news stories about it. There's no uh, Times reporters there. Oh, God's doing this incredible thing right here. That's almost never the case. It's almost always where you would 
least expected. And isn't this the story of Advent? Isn't this the story of Christmas? God doing something incredible and nobody noticed it? The angels came and they're like, he's here, he's here, go see him. To some shepherds out in the field who were like, whoa, let's go check it out. And they went and checked it out and they went and told all kinds of people, but it wasn't on the front page. The news, if God didn't have it recorded in the book, we might not even know about it. He didn't come with royal robes and things like that. He came to a teenage girl who was betrothed to marry a guy and found herself pregnant by the Lord's design. I wonder how many people believed that. Now, when they showed up in the place that uh, they were going to pay taxes, it wasn't like people were like, hey, mother of the Messiah, right here, make way, make room. They knocked on the door at the inn and they said, sorry, it's full. Uh, there's some room out where the animals sleep. You can sleep there. Isn't, that's just kind of the way that God loves to roll. He loves to do it where you least expect it. He loves to show up and do something mighty through people you would never think. And this is the crazy thing. God has used you in a mighty way that you wouldn't think. If you're a part of this church, I want you to know that God has been doing things through this church that other churches that are a hundred times the size, have a hundred times the budget, have a hundred times the staff, they aren't doing these things. Why? Well, because it's a God thing. It's not a thing that can be done by humans. It's not a thing that a pastor could be sitting in his back office, stroking his chin and going, you know what? You know what we need to do? We need to send an agent to Pakistan. Let's make something happen over there. It's something that the Lord does. He's shifting these pieces around. And all of a sudden, your pastor, who's a no-account nobody, if you go around Spokane asking other pastors, hey, you heard of Reverend Paul, like, who? From the adopted church. Where's that? I've never heard of that church. That's what you will hear. We've been around for 10 years, guys. <laughs> and yet somehow God moved all of these pieces around so that I had the opportunity to go in. These people don't see Americans. They don't see pastors. They don't see churches expressing their, hey, we want to check in on you guys. We want to see what's going on. And so this was maybe the first thing that, that was uh, just, the whole trip was kind of shocking. Kind of shocking that it happened, first off. Kind of shocking that um, I was there, that people received me. I was under the assumption that Pakistan is a very dangerous place, especially for Americans, especially for Christian Americans, and that there would be trouble all the way through, and this would be some sort of a clandestine operation operating out of the basement of some you know, pastor there, some ministry there, sneaking here and there, coming up with excuses why we were going there and, and doing this thing. And actually, that was just not the case. I found that the Pakistani government not only knew I was there, they were happy that I was there, and they wanted to ensure that I was able to do whatever I wanted to do without any sort of hindrance. Yeah. So uh, their version of Homeland Security is called the Security Department. The Security Department found out that I was coming, and they assigned uh, armed guards to escort me everywhere that we went. And I thought, oh, these are going to be my, my minders. You know, they're going to be like, sorry, you can't go over there. Sorry, we don't want you to. Nope. They, we, we went wherever we wanted to go. And, and the main danger to a guy like me is that people are so excited, were so excited to see me. Like everybody, out of their minds, excited. They saw me. Who's that guy over there? It's a, an American. Of, ah! It felt like I was, you know, Brad Pitt in Small Town USA, you know? And everybody's like, that's the movie star. No, he's not here. He's here. And like, look at the photo on the, that's him. And like, let's run over and see if we can't take a picture, shake hands. And it's like, mom, coming in to see me. And that's what the armed guards were for, was so that I didn't get mobbed by well-wishers and 
have, you know, not a good time. So that was shocking to me. I found out that I was most welcome in this place, not just by the Christians, the poor Christians, but by the Muslims. Not just by the low account, no account people who are like, hey, you got some money? But by police officers and government officials, they really wanted me to be there. One of the things about Pakistan that maybe this isn't really like part of my sermon or my message is they have a hospitality culture. They have a food culture. They have a I honor you, you honor me culture, an honor culture. And so if you're somebody, which like it or not, if you went there, you're going to be somebody because you're from America. And especially if you're from a church, you're from some organization that is trying to do good, you're going to have thousands of people who want to meet you, who want to show you pictures of their family, who want to invite you over for tea. And most of all, they want to shower you with affection. So every place that I went, we pull up the van, we're going to visit this church. Okay, pull up with the van. The church is, you know, it's 20 yards from the van to the front door of the church. And there is a line of people on both sides and crowd. And they all have a little bowl of flower petals. And they're waiting for me to go by so they can throw <laughs> flower petals on me. So I've got this 20-yard gauntlet of flowers. And, um, and you can, you're only allowed to take two or three steps. Then you need to stop while there. And someone's going to hang flowers around your neck. And they're going to hand, hand you bouquets of flowers and gifts. People I've never met before. And there's this like, gift with a... Tweety Bird wrapping paper on. I'm like, what the heck is going on? Never met these people in my life. I'm here to try to help to see what's going on. And they, their biggest concern was that I would not feel welcomed, that I would not feel like I was the rock star of the world. This hospitality culture was um, amazing to me. Getting me into a person's house was a, and this is part of their, you don't have to go do something. You could just go and visit. There's actually nothing really to say, nothing really to, but to say that American pastor was here. He was here. So oftentimes when I would go into a village or something, there would be a list of elders. Hey, these are the most important people in the village. We need you to go into their house. For what? Just to go in there. Okay, wreaths and gifts, and I'd walk into their house and walk out. And they were so amazed, like, yes! Because they could tell people that American was here in my living room. It was crazy to me. They have a, let's call it a subsistence economy. They don't have a lot of extra money. Um, unless you're the elite of the elite living in the big cities, everybody else is just getting by. And so uh, everything is, uh, that is made locally is very, very, very inexpensive because that's all that people can afford. So I'll try to illustrate that in a... One of the things that I was doing over there was just trying to provide immediate, immediate assistance to the people who needed it most. Okay? So oftentimes what we would do is we would buy a package of food and give it to a family that was in desperate need. And I was not the one making the determination about who was in need and who wasn't. Because you or me will be like, everybody here is in desperate need. Uh, but the local pastors are like, no, 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 no. Everybody here is not in desperate need. In this village, there's 20 families that are in need. Nobody else is in desperate need. And they're you know, living in a little brick hut with a, you think, no, these people are in need. But they just have a different sense of what need is. Need is the people who are actually starving. That's need. Everybody else is okay. So this food package, which would feed a family of four to six for about two weeks, okay? So it had like 20 pounds of flour, a bunch of rice and beans and soap and salt and other things like that, cost... 4,000 Pakistani rupees, which is somewhere in the neighborhood of like $15. $15 can buy a family two weeks of food. So, like, it's amazing 
how much your money can do over there. Um, and especially when you're using the local pastors who are filtering out who's actually in need, who's not in need. They go through and they have their agents who've gone through this town. They know these people. And so we were just meeting with the people who, who had the greatest amount of need. And, and so uh, food. And then in the places where there was a couple of places where the Muslims and the Christians, the poor, are mixed together. And those are the most dangerous places where the Christians and the Muslims are mixed together. Because there is a certain amount of hostility towards somebody making it. We actually couldn't bring food to those places. Because if we brought food, then, then you know, our van would pull up, people come out with a sack of food, the neighbors would have seen it, and it would have caused some strife. And so we just went in there, just a couple of us, we would meet with a family, and then uh, the pastor that I was working with, Pastor John, he would give them a cash, and he was like, these people in this village, we're giving them 5,000 uh, 5, Pakistani rupees to take care of their family, maybe like three weeks here. And once again, that's you know somewhere in the neighborhood of like $17. And he would just give that to them in cash so that they could buy a little bit of food here, a little bit of food there, so they could get by and it wouldn't cause any waves. And so, um, so my trip there, I, I guess the first word that I would describe it is just shocking at all of these things that I had not expected. Um, and in the, the shocking need, but also the shocking hospitality and blessings and gifts that people insisted that they give to me. And this surprised me. It also surprised me that these, these people have a faith that is so simple. And that was kind of, uh, I've used the word shocking so many times, haven't I? Uh, it was eye-opening. Because here are the people in greatest need, they have a faith just like you and I. Right? At some point, you come to the end of your own resources. And the end of your own resources is where your prayer life takes over, your faith takes over. Well, the difference is we just have an awful lot of faith in our own resources, right? And they have that same faith in their own resources. They just have a lot less resources. And so their prayer life starts right away. Their faith life starts right away. They're praying for miracles right away, and those miracles are still miracles, but it's something along the lines of, Lord, we're hungry. Lord, winter's setting in. We don't have blankets. You know, Lord, we, we need to be able to get to this and such city so that I can meet this guy who's going to, and we have no way to get there. Lord, like, can you help us? Will you do something? Will you... Will you take care of my children? Lord, my children are sick. One of the things that uh, you all did with me as your representative, we brought a bunch of over-the-counter medication there. Because there's a lot of children who die because they don't have Tylenol. And they spike a fever because that's what kids do. They get sick, right? And here, your kid gets sick. They're spiking a fever. You give them a little Tylenol. They sleep it off. They get better. And there, they can't sleep it off. And so kids are dying from a fever because they don't have Tylenol. And so we brought Tylenol over there, and they're like, these parents who brought to me a sick kid and were like, hey, Pastor John, get the Tylenol. We brought, I, I went to Costco and I looted Costco. And we brought all kinds of Tylenol and ibuprofen. And, and, uh, and so like, give them just a little piece and blah, blah, blah. And the next day they would come back and be like, thank you, God, thank you, God, my child's better. My kid was sick for three days. Thank you, God, over a quarter of a tablet of Tylenol. That's the kind of faith that they, they just, they need everything. And they, here's what I discovered. If you need everything, if everything's a miracle, then you live a pretty blessed life, don't you? When God is providing every little thing that you need, when it's this little thing, that little thing, and to them, they're not little things. To you, they're little things. To me, they're little things. A quarter of a tablet of Tylenol. I don't need to pray that the Lord would 
provide that for my sake. They do. So when it happens, they're like, he's so good. And it was inspiring to be with people who just see God doing things all over the place. And it challenged me to be like, you know what? God has done all of those miracles that he's doing. and He's done those miracles in my life. It's just that I feel like my own personal resources cover it, right? But actually, who gave those personal resources? That's no less blessing, no less miracle. Last thing about these people that I just found inspiring. Because everything's a miracle, the size of the miracle doesn't really matter. Right? If, if, what's the difference with you, if, for you praying for $10 million versus $20 million? Maybe they're kind of the same thing, aren't they? Way out there, probably not going to happen. Big, big, big. And like, they have no problem having the faith that God's going to do something huge here. Something huge. The Lord's going to do something huge here because the Lord's doing stuff all the time. And so they have no problem being like, you know what we need? We need a school. Like, well, you also need a quarter of a tablet of Tylenol that you're praying for, you know. What's the likely? Well, for them, there's not much of a difference. I found that inspiring. Like, wow, do I, do I have that kind of faith? The kind of faith that is like, no, 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 here's what God needs to do. God, we're going to start praying for this thing right here. It's a huge mountain. Move that mountain, Lord. And for them, they just see the Lord moving mountains all the time. That was inspiring to me. And I, I had this incredible experience that I want to tell you about. I was working with Pastor John. Pastor John, is, well, everybody's short over there, but he's, he's short, he's short for, a, for, a, for a Pakistani man. He is slight for a Pakistani man. I am the complete physical opposite of Pastor John. My voice, I usually don't even need a microphone. I just naturally project my voice, and he can't project anything. You're always going like, what? What did you say? What did you... His, his voice is very soft. He's kind of a stern guy, but very kind, very soft-spoken, very, um, and he just doesn't, he just doesn't have a, a mean bone uh, in his body. And... And, and then I was just like, we're going to do what Pastor John wants. So like, yes, I want to visit the brick kiln, but nobody asked me for anything. Pastor John's the one who's going to do all of the, he's making the decisions on all of the things. So I'm just here to tag along and see what God is up to. So we were heading into this brick kiln village. We were going to a church service in a few hours. And we were on our way to the pastor's house because we needed to visit with him for a certain amount of time before it was like, Okay, visiting time complete. The American is done. Okay, now let's go to the church service. And uh, as we were walking there, just me and Pastor John, a couple of other people, our security people, um, we were walking through the brick kiln village to the pastor's house on the other side. And there was a guy who kind of poked out in the alleyway, and, and he said in Urdu, but he was like, you guys should come in here. And Pastor John was like, okay, let's go in there. Uh, there's a family in here that they want you to meet. and so. We just, this is all, all just happens then, right? We go in there, and there is a family there. The husband was in some sort of accident, sickness, something. Uh, he's, half of his body's paralyzed. And, uh, and he can't provide for his family anymore. And so they're in the brick kilns, and the kids are making bricks, but they can't produce as many bricks as a grown man can produce. And so they're just in desperate, desperate, He's got a stick that he's like leaning on and trying to, to get around. His wife is up to here in tasks because she's trying to run the household and make bricks on the side so they can make enough bricks so they can make enough money to eat. And they haven't eaten in a while, and they're desperate. And we just chance met them. And, um, and it was just to shake their hands and because this guy poked his head out and was like, you should come in here. And, and we did. And... It was like the Lord revealed to me as, as we were there, and all of a sudden I got really concerned for this guy. I was like, he's half paralyzed. His wife is, she was dealing with some kind of sickness too. They're, you know, working as hard as they can work. There's no way they can keep up with just the need for food. They're obviously hungry. They got three kids here, and the kids are little. They're not 15-year-olds. They're six-year-olds. But Pastor John, I think we probably should have brought a gift with us to help these people. Pastor John, yeah, we should have, but we didn't. 
And then the Lord reminded me, you brought money. I put some money in my bag because when we went to the church services, one of the things I like to do is give a little money to the churches that we visit. It's like, hey, this is from the adopted church and all the other people, like a little gift for you. Not an insane amount of money, but enough that over there a church would be like, yay! So, um, so we, we, I, I gave a little bit of this money to Pastor John. Pastor John gave it to this guy. And this guy is just a hard, he's got a hard face. He's wearing kind of this little thing wrapped on his head. He's leaning on his stick. And, um, and he took the money, he looked at it, and he put it in his pocket, and he bowed his head a little bit. And then he just started shaking and sobbing. Because God had provided rescue for him and his family. And we accidentally showed up there. And the Lord kind of showed to me in this one little moment, all of these thousands of moving pieces on one side of the equation, our side of the equation, all of the people who were moved, who the money was raised, the you should go, the can I go, the buying, the all of the things that happened to get me there to that one spot representing God's provision. And then all of the thousands of pieces on the other side, starting with this man's prayers in the middle of the night, as he's listening to his kids, hungry and whining in bed, and praying, God, help. God, do something. And all of the people, the pastor we were going to visit, and the guy who poked out of his head in the alleyway, and all of the chance things that the Lord made happen so that we could be there and this money could be exchanged, and this dude could be just totally overwhelmed, blessed, like, oh, we're going to be able to eat for a month now. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. I just had this really holy feeling of like, Look at all the things God did for this one man. And then I thought, like, I feel good. And I thought, God, how much do you feel? It was like, I'm only seeing, I'm only getting a glimpse of a part of what, he's probably like, there's not thousands of pieces. There's millions of pieces. And I put them all together for this one guy. God, you must feel amazing. You must feel so good about yourself. Just all of the pieces you're putting into place, this master jet, and I just made me go like, thank you. What a pleasure. What a pleasure it is to be used by you. Because like I said, God can do anything. He could have made the stones turn into bread. But for whatever reason, God decided to use human hands. He decided to use you. He decided to use me. He decided to use all of these other things. Is that less of a miracle or more of a miracle? Then bread being turned, then stones being turned into bread. And it made me want to say, you know, I need to remind my church when I get home, are you praying, God, use me? You know, did you just keep in your eyes open of the machinery that God's going on around you, that there are no chance encounters, that God is, wants to do mighty, incredible, wonderful things for you? And in that, just that one little moment, there's probably thousands of these moments in my trip there in Pakistan. But for this one, it was like God allowed me to see what he was doing. And I could just kind of hear the angel chorus, the hallelujahs, the glory glories at the Lord providing for, for this man and his family through you, through me. And I thought, how much more faith would we have if we had the eyes to see what God's already doing? Just the mighty things that God's doing, not just here, all over the place. Um, and then the next sort of thought is I want to talk about the problems in Pakistan. I'll call this point faithful and a little trusted with much. Um, because American money um, and like regular money goes a long, long, long way in Pakistan, you might ask, like, well, then what's the problem? You know, if you can provide for a full family for two weeks for $12, why, why are these people hungry? <laughs> you know, what, doesn't our government give like tens of millions in foreign aid? Don't, aren't there all these NGOs like in the field of players who are making a difference? You and I were, were nobodies with their, our little, the entire time was, I was over there, I spent about five grand. And it was work to spend that much money because money goes so far there. It was work to spend $5,000 going to churches and ministries and visiting all of these people all over the place. Here's food. Here's, you know, just meeting needs all over the place. And it was 
work the last couple of days, I was like, oh, no, I still got lots of money I got to get rid of. Pastor Don, let's go, got to find more people. Here, here, here. It's crazy. It, and it's because of corruption. That's the problem. And if you think that corruption is just something for some police officers, some, you know, government bureaucrats somewhere who are lining their own pockets, the army, the... Well, you'd be right about that, but it's not just them. There's a lot of corruption in God's church in Pakistan. There's a lot of pastors who make a living by pretending that they're meeting people's needs. And then when they get some money from a church, from a pastor, from a concerned person who sees a thing on Facebook and they're like, hey, I want to give, and they give 50 bucks, they give a hundred bucks, they do something like that. That person is not going out and caring for people with that money. That person has a business making it look like they're caring for people, showing you the incredible need and saying, won't you give? And then you give and they put it in their own pocket. This is the tool that the enemy uses. It is a selfishness, a greed. It's crazy. Faithful Christians everywhere always have this feeling like, I have more than enough. Even these people in the brick kiln, they're giving me gifts. I felt so ashamed of myself. But my translator was like, don't you dare refuse this gift. That would be very rude. These people are giving you a gift. They want to bless you. They want to they want to bless your people are giving me money when I prayed for them. I was like, I can't. I cannot receive 10 rupees from this lady who's like, please pray for me. And she said, you cannot refuse. If you refuse that gift, you will be beyond root. They are trying to take care of you because they have the faith that says, I have enough. That's the spirit of God. When the Spirit of God is moving, we go, I have enough. That, actually, I'm looking around. I have more than enough. Why can't I be generous? But the Spirit of the enemy creeps in amongst God's people and says, you don't have enough. You don't have enough. And when they get a sum of money that over there is incredible, I can care for my family for a year. Rather than going, oh, that's too much. I got to care for other people's families too. They go, no, no, no. And that's not enough. I need more. I need more, I need more, I need more. And so there are a few people who go by the name of Christian. They go by the name of pastor, of minister, and they are fleecing God's people. They are corrupt. And there is a warm spot in hell for those people because the Spirit of God says, I am moving, I am doing. Be a part of what I'm doing. You get your grubby little fingers in there and start stuffing it into your own pockets and into your own mouth and trying to run away and hide and keep all that stuff for yourself. There's going to come a retribution from the Lord. And I told that to my host pastor. And I may have met the only guy who has a reputation as an honest pastor. Pastor John has, an honest, has a reputation as an honest pastor. In fact, when a person from this congregation said, hey, when you're over there, I want you to check up on this one. I have a friend who is sending money to this person who's running an orphanage, doing all this sort of stuff. So I said to, my, to Pastor John, I said, hey, I need to do this special favor. And I, like, like, I just need you, I don't actually need you to go there. I just, could you call somebody and ask, is this person legit doing, the, doing this stuff or not? But he was so determined that I would get a straight answer. He went there himself. And he didn't have my security guards with him. We went in there, met this family who's living high on the hog, told them we're trying to, you know, my, my, my daughter saw you on social media. We're trying to do this and that. And, and so they got in. They went into the house. And then once the lady figured out, oh, wait, you're here to find out whether or not I'm really taking care of people, she attacked him. Her family attacked Pastor John. The only reason he was saved is because even in this city, a different city, he had such a reputation as an honest guy that one of the local politicians came in and basically rescued him and said, you're not going to attack this man. He does good work here, blah, 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 blah. And he escaped without injury because 
I'm just telling you, the corruption is so terrible, even amongst God's people. And Pastor John has been doing this work for, really, for a long time. And so when I, like I said, I didn't go out and give money to anyone. I only ever gave it to Pastor John and said, you take care of them. And I started doing the math. Okay, two days ago I gave him this much money. Here are the food packages. We did an inspection on a food package, checked all the prices. I was like, this dude isn't taking any. I expected, like, hey, we're going to be taking care of, I'm putting a lot of work onto your plate. You should also take care of your family too. That would be fair. He did not take any, not a single. And at the end, I, at the end of my trip, I said, Pastor John, we've been an encouragement to so many people. I just want you to know, the Lord has really made this clear to me. I'm also here to be an encouragement to you. Because you have been so faithful for so long with so little. You've been faithful for so long with so little. And I can see you are growing weary and doing good. Because you're looking around at all these other corrupt dudes who are getting their end covered. They're getting rich. They're getting cars. They're providing a future for their children. You're still broke. You're still living in a beat-up little house on the edge of Farukabad. You are still have sewage running down the side of your house. You're still living in a way that is incredibly modest, and you are taking care of all of, all of this, these resources are going right through your hands. And I want to tell you, the Lord sees that you are faithful. And he's saying now to you, since you have been faithful with a little, you will be trusted with much. You're our guy. Corruption ruins everything. The spirit of Satan is a spirit of greed that never has enough. And it challenged me to have the spirit of God, the spirit of generosity, the spirit that says, not only do I have enough, I have more than enough. I have enough and extra to care for people. There is only one group of people who is actually caring for the poor, really. And it is the Christians who are not corrupt. That work is happening in Pakistan. I was there. I saw it. I did all kinds of snap inspections to see, like, hey, what's actually going on here? They're not just taking care of the Christian poor. They're taking care of the Muslim poor. That's, that's what's going on. This is a, and maybe I'll just conclude with this. God is doing an incredible work everywhere. Of course he's doing it in Pakistan. But he's doing it here too. There is an explosion in Pakistan because the existing church structures are pretty doggone corrupt. Small independent churches are the ones who are doing the work. Churches like ours. Small independent churches. And they build a little church building once they've been in operation for however long and they've saved up the money and they build a little church building. It's a concrete box, basically. They roll a carpet on the floor. Every Sunday, people come up to the door, take off their shoes, walk onto the carpet, worship God for a few hours, and then go out, put their shoes on, head home. God is doing that kind of a thing. I saw it in Kenya. I saw it in Paraguay. I saw it in Pakistan. God is doing incredible miracles through these small churches. God seems to be doing a universal work across the world in small independent churches that are nimble, that are, that are ready, that are faithful, that are punching way above their weight class as far as what the amount of good that they're doing versus the amount of resources that they have. These small little churches that are powerhouses. And the thing that they are doing that is most important is they are training new leaders. Not to say that there aren't big churches in Pakistan or here. There are, and I'm not saying they're bad. A lot of them are very good. But they don't need a bunch of new leaders. One guy can kind of take care of the whole church massive thing and hand it off to his son when he's, they don't need to be constantly raising up new leaders. But guys like Pastor John, other guys like him, they are opening up churches every few months, 
raising up leaders, saying, go take care of that church. I'm taking care of four churches right now. I'm preaching four different churches on Sunday. I need someone to take that church over there. Go be faithful with that. And these new leaders are coming up. New leaders mean new blood, mean new partnerships. All kinds of new partnerships are happening in the church. And best of all, miracles. So many testimonies of people, and it's not, it's not some guy in a really expensive sh- uh, suit who does a crusade to tens of thousands of people and makes all kinds of money, and he's the holy guy, he's the guy that all the miracles ha- are happening through. No, it's happening just like it happens here in this church. The pastor who's praying, and a lot of those prayers don't get answers, but sometimes the Lord does something amazing. And that's happening all over the place. So here's my closing thought. Our faith, our Christianity, our relationship with the Lord, what we are doing, the Word of God, it takes a certain amount of faith. Faith that God's real, that He's loving, that He's doing a work, and that He'll care for us. And the Christians who have that belief, God is good and He will take care of me, those people are the ones who are the difference makers here and over there. Those are the people who are actually making, and I wonder, since God prefers to make a difference through human hands, will he be able to use ours? Will we yield ourselves to what God is doing? Will we be faithful with just a little bit? There's people around you right now, people around me. There's neighbors and friends and coworkers. There's classmates. There's little things all over. And if we will start allowing God to use us in faith in those little things, we might find that he's ready to do something big. Let's pray. Father, we just want to uh, thank you um, for for bringing me back safe and sound. We want to thank you for the health blessings my entire trip over there. I didn't have uh, any debilitating flare-ups. That was amazing and wonderful. Lord, uh, we thank you for the inspiration to be able to see you working here, to see you working there, to, to know that you are up to incredible things. We just pray that you would put your hand of blessing over those of your people who are faithful. Those who have not bowed their knee to corruption. Those who allow your blessings to go through them. They don't just line their own pockets and go home and and, and want more. Those of your faithful people who just put your blessing on them, Lord. Do not allow them to grow weary of doing good. Provide encouragement. Take care of their family. You say in your word that the children of a righteous man will not beg for bread. That you will provide. So we just ask that you would do that. Lord God, would you also open up our own hearts, our own uh, spiritual sensitivity to the work that you're doing right now all around us. Give us the ability to see your miracle, to to see the things that you, the incredible things that you are doing. And oftentimes they're just the smallest thing. Someone who's lonely and is desperately praying that you would put someone in their life who cares about them. People who are convinced that their life is a waste. Lord, your people are all over, and we just, Sometimes we just don't see the hurting and the needy around us. Would you cause us to be those who have a generous spirit because we believe in a generous God? Lord, we also just ask that you would provide your spirit to punish the wicked, especially inside the family of faith those people who use your name to abuse other people, just pray against that. Lord God, would you do something 
to stop that kind of corrupt behavior that perverts what you are trying to do? And would you keep in mind all of those needy people who, who are desperately crying out, would you just use your faithful to meet those needs? Thank you, Lord Jesus, for allowing us to be people of the kingdom, knights in shining spiritual armor lended to us from our Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray that you would cause us to be a blessing. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, that name that is above every name. Amen. Amen.